Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Awesome. Perfect. Hey, everybody. I'm Brittany Christensen. I'm the CEO of AidKit, and I have the distinguished honor of introducing this two-part panel. Um, so I know some folks are coming in from bathroom break and getting coffee, so we'll kind of take a minute as folks get settled. Um, but this panel is on Cook County Promise, and it's the road to permanency. So not only is Cook County Promise the largest guaranteed income program in U.S. history at $42 million, yeah, but also, not only but also, it's um, the, first, um, the first pilot that's committed to um, permanency after the pilot program ends. So uh, it's very, very exciting. And um, we're going to break this down into a two-part panel so that you can first hear from the most important people that are involved in the pilot, and that's the participants themselves. So really honored that we have with us here today three participants. We've got Clarence, Bella, and Taylor Raquel. And then we also have one of, our, one of the PIs um, that's leading the research. Uh, we've got Dr. Shantae Robinson from IEL here with us today. Yeah. <laughs> and Shantae is going to go ahead and lead us um, through the first part of the panel, which is a discussion with the participants. So uh, Shantae, take it away. Thank you, Brittany. Appreciate that. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you to you three for being here especially. So we're going to kick it off with my first question. Uh, and Clarence, we'll start with you. Okay. How did you hear about the Cook County Promise? Actually, it was uh, through a member of our church. Um, my mom is a path pastor, and she has been for, she's coming up on her 46th year anniversary. And uh, I'm a bodyguard by profession. And I guess this member noticed that I'm always home. I usually travel. I'm usually out of town. And uh, so she sent me a link for the program. Uh, she texted it to me. I didn't know what it was. And it sat on my phone for probably five or six days. And then I, I clicked on the link. I said, hmm, guaranteed money. I'll, I'll keep going. And you know, I, I, it was a, a relatively simple process. And uh, a couple of days later, it said that I've been selected to you know, receive the award. And so I checked the link again, and I made sure that there were no viruses on my phone or anything. <laughs> and uh, then I decided to go down in person and, and check it out. And so that's, that's how I found out, through a member of the church. Great. Bella, what about you? Yes. So my name is Bella, um, and I found out about the program through my uh, place of employment. Um, we were sending it out to families who might qualify, and then looking at the requirements, I was like, oh we qualify. So I applied online, and that's how I did it. Oh. Taylor? So I happened to be watching the news, which is something I normally don't do, and it flashed across the screen, and I'm like, okay, I don't normally win anything, lottery, okay, I'm going to give it a you know, try, it's online application, it doesn't hurt to at least apply, and I applied, and the application process was very easy, they even offered an in-person option, and I appreciated that, and it was very short, and I found out a couple months later, a couple weeks later, that I was selected, and I was so elated. <laughs> what about you, Bella? How did you find the application process itself? I found overall the application process um, was pretty simple and straightforward. I have access to technology and Wi-Fi, so I applied on my computer. But I appreciated the in-person option um, for some of the folks who didn't. Um, say, I liked how, you know, it was very like, oh, your name, your address, this and that. Um, it laid out all the qualifications, um, like you need to be a resident of Cook County. And overall, it was pretty easy. All right. Clarence, tell me about the day you found out you had received the, the award. Well, again, <coughs> I had to make sure <laughs> that it was actually real because, you know, I normally don't win anything either. And um, I said, wow, this is, this is really great. So after I did the in-person interview when I came home, I said, okay, $500 a month for 24 months. And so then I started figuring out what I was going to use the money for. Um, the simplest thing for me to do would be to find a bill that I know is going to be constant for those 24 months and just apply it. And so that's what I did, and it worked out really easy. 
she immediately went to your spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just happy that there wasn't long division used in the, in, the, yeah. you know, in the application process. But yeah, since I didn't have an income, there are certain things that I want to keep, you know, um, keep current. And uh, insurance is one of life insurance, health insurance. Those are the things that are most important to me now. Um, and so that's, you know, it, it takes, it's a big stress reliever because you, don't, you no longer have to decide, you know, am I gonna buy the medicine or am I going to be able to pay the copay? Or, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's such a stress reliever in so many, on so many levels. And not only that, it, you know, um, the, the award also helps you to, I like to say, be present. I have a grandson and he's, uh, um, he plays baseball in high school. He's gonna be a superstar one day. And uh, I get to see his games. And so I'm not always out of town. And the reason that I took a leave of absence from my job is because my mom, she's 87, and she's the busiest 87-year-old person I know. Um, and she's got so many schedules and so many meetings in her schedule, doctor's visits, uh, church organizations, and, and things like that. And plus, I'm also the maintenance guy at the church. So it, it helps me stay, and it helps me take care of her. Bella, what about you? Yes, so I was driving in my car when I got the text message. It's like, you have been selected to be a recipient. Um, kind of like Clarence, I was like, no way. This is real. I was jazzed. It was such a great moment. So the first person I called was my mom. And then she was Googling things. She's like, oh my gosh, you know what this happened? And then I called my husband. And then I sent out a message to all my friends. I was like, look, we won something. You know, we get to be a part of it. Kind of like they said. And no, I was just overjoyed. And then the mon uh, our first payment came around December, um, which was great timing because I was transitioning um, from one job into my new job, and then my new job ended up falling through. So um, having the money come during that time was pivotal. Taylor, where were you when you found out you were a recipient? So I actually had been sick with E. coli. I didn't have much of a Thanksgiving. And the money, I got a text message and I'm looking like unbelievable. Like I was selected, okay. So it asked um, how do you wanna receive um, the payment? And again, there was options, paper check, direct deposit. I selected direct deposit because that's the most easiest for me. And I was, just amazed. I called my mom like, mom, I can't believe it. I got select like out of all the people that apply. Cook County is one of the largest counties in the U.S. Like, I can't believe this. This is God. I'm so grateful. And like Bella said, it came in December. So it was right on time for Christmas to be able to celebrate the holidays for my family. That meant so much. I was so grateful. Hmm. Let's keep going with that. How do you make use of the of the stipend or the money each month? So for me, it comes in handy. Um, I battle with PTSD, so my main source of income is um, Social Security Disability, which I receive once a month, and I don't have any dependents. I don't have children or husband or anything like that, so um, I get a little bit more than the average person my age, and um, I'm not a, I don't qualify for Medicaid, the state coverages. I have a spend down, $498 a month that I have to meet if I want additional coverages such as vision and dental. And for me, it has been so beyond words can express how elated and happy I am to be able to access medical coverages such as then going to the dentist <coughs> and going to get my eyes checked and just simple things like that has been, it's been very helpful. Um, also, I've been able to pay my car note, car insurance, so which I'm, when I'm able to work, now I have a vehicle that I, the payment is made. Like Clarence said, it's a stress reliever. It's been so many months and days before I started receiving the payment that it was like my bills were exceeding my income and it has been a help. Mm. It has been a tremendous help. Mm. So we can see through data and other mechanisms how folks are spending the money. If you saw the documentary, they're able to track where in the communities folks are spending money. What are you able to do, or what does this money allow you to do 
that we can't track, some of those intangibles that are so important to you that the money allows you to do? Well, oh, there oh. Oh. I'll say, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, as I said before, my grandson, he's, he's 16 years old, he plays baseball. I was always missing his games because I was always out of town. And I took a leave of absence Mother's Day weekend of 22. And so, you know, I got to see one of his games, but then, you know, I would take local assignments just to, you know, keep the income going. And it was getting to be too much because, you know, my mom is getting pro progressively, um, her illness is prog progressing. And so I'd like to stay around the house with her and to be there. And so that doesn't involve money. It, it involves security. The fact that I don't have to worry about the money. It doesn't cost me anything to be there. But at the same time, I don't have to worry about uh, how am I going to pay for whatever you know, I normally pay for because I'm there. And, uh, and you know, I like to see my grandson playing baseball. So it allow, there's, a lot, there's so many intangible things that the money does that you really can't explain because it's not always about receiving the money and then giving it. It's the fact that you know you have it coming in. And so you can make plans according to that to be, just be present. Kind of, yeah, bouncing off what Clarence said for me. Um, so I'm a first time mom. My baby is now one years old. His name is Felix IV. He's my favorite person. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the intangible moments that like you wouldn't see with just receiving the money is I have the ability to work part time now um, with getting the money. So every Tuesday and Thursday, I get to wake up, I see his smile, his mama, and I get to spend, you know, the whole day with him while having the security that on the 15th, the money will be coming in. Um, I use it to pay my half of the mortgage. Um, and that I just have this time with him that I can't get back. So, you know, I've been there to see his first steps, you know, hear his first words, we go to library events. And just like those, like you said, those intangible moments that I wouldn't have mm -hmm. um, if I was working full time or if he was in full time childcare. And then there were so many times when I would get calls when I was away that my mom was in the hospital. And so, you know, I'd constantly call and find out who the charge nurse is and, hey, I'm Clarence, I'm in California or wherever I am, and I'm her son, and I just want to check on her. And I've even left assignments to go and to be with her. So it makes me feel really good. It, that's one of the, that's the largest intangible that there mm -hmm. is, the fact that I get to be here with her. And I think you said it best, like just being able to be present in the moment yeah, without absolutely. the fear of, yes. Mm. Taylor, what about you? For me, it's been helping improve my health because again, when you have less to stress and worry about, we know life can bring day-to-day -day challenges, but not having to stress and worry about my dental coverages or vision, that's a huge plus for me. And which means it's less trips to my therapist, um, more time, like Bella and Clarence say, more time to spend with my family and go to family events. Um, it was amazing to be able to participate in Christmas grab bag this year. Like I didn't have to sit by and just watch, but I was able to participate and that meant a lot. Mm -hmm. What does the Cook County Promise do for your communities where you're from? It helps me to be able to participate. Um, just like the session before that talked about um, Chelsea and how you just never know how many people in the community are not able to go out and just eat at the local coffee shop or um, just simple things like that, but now I'm able to participate. I can go to the local coffee shop. I can go to the local boutique. I can buy a pair of shoes. It, it means a lot because when I'm able to support them, they then can turn around and support the community too. They're being supported. It's our economy growing and thriving. Our neighborhood thrives. Mm. Well, for me, I can, <laughs> I can use my neighbors on either side you know, for good examples. Um, one neighbor, she saw me putting lawn furniture together. And so automatically, parents, would you be so nice? So yeah, I was there to do that. <laughs> you know? My other neighbor owns a restaurant and uh, he was like, hey, you, you're in town for a while. I'm, well, maybe. And you know, so then he wants me to, to help him to prepare his, his meats and get them together. I like to barbecue, so you know, it's, you know. So my community benefits from both sides just by me being there. You know? <laughs> and I like it because, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if it's by nature or by force of habit. I'm a, work, a workaholic, 
you know, and I'm just, I'm gone, gone, gone all the time. And so I think this is the longest that I have been here in Chicago on a continual basis for at least the last 12, 13 years. I think for me and my community, um, you know, getting the money in, it's more like the ability of working part-time. I've been able to do more, so like I've become a volunteer, um, we attend different library events, you know, I'm way more involved in the happenings around the community than I was before just because I have the freedom of time. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. What has been a participant in the Cook County Promise meant to you in terms of your belief and trust in the government? And I'm talking about government at all different levels, local, state, and federal. I think being a participant in the program um, has increased my trust in our local government because, you know, by piloting it, you know, they're saying, we see you, we hear you, we see that our community has needs, and it's more than just words, you know, they're actions that they're committed to try and make this work. Um, so being a participant, again, has increased it, and I appreciate everything that Cook County is doing, you know? They're trusting in their people. I, I'm the same. It makes me hopeful um, because a pilot program is just that to see the need and also the results. And I'm looking forward to this being not just local for Cook County, but all the counties across the U.S. because when they see that I'm able to, again, participate in my local economy, which trickles down to the larger economy, then it helps everyone, you know? Um, and it, it, it's a two-way trust. I, I feel like Cook County also trusts me, that I'm a person in need, and they trust that I'm gonna use it to get those things, basic necessities, such as healthcare, things that I wouldn't be otherwise, without the program, be able to afford. So I look at it as a two-way, two um, street with the trust like they trust me and I trust them more and I'm I'm standing behind my Cook County government mm -hmm. I've been a long time resident and I'm not looking to go anywhere yep. he's, <laughs> he's leading it. he's very happy with that with that answer <laughs> and that's really what it is it, it's about the trust because the one big difference that I've noticed in this program uh, that that far far exceeds other government programs is that uh, I won't say that it's by design, but as an end result, with a lot of these programs, once you're in them, the moment that you actually start to do better, you have to leave yep. the program. You no longer qualify for it. And so it's just a matter of time before you get back to the place that you were when you needed assistance in the first place. And so, you, you know, you don't have to watch every dollar that, that comes in and, and be in fear that you're no longer going to be eligible for the reward. Mm. And so that's, that's the biggest difference for me that I, that I can see. So yeah, I, I like it that the government trusts us. What do you want people in your community to know about guaranteed income? Particularly those folks who are unfamiliar with these programs, uh, either at a local or federal level, they don't know about guaranteed income. So what would you tell those folks about this program and what it does for folks? I would say, you know, uh, look it over. You, chances are that you're going to qualify for the program if you're low to, to medium income. And it doesn't put a stipulation on any other income like Social Security or uh, if you have a fixed income. It doesn't put a, a restriction on that as far as how much you can get from whatever uh, type of stipend you're, you're receiving. And uh, it would help a lot of people, I'm sure, because, you know, I mean, with the economy now, uh, many people, even I like to call them the working poor, you know? A lot of people are just one or two paychecks away from being homeless. And so $500 isn't gonna, you know, it's not gonna let you, you know, retire to Malibu or someplace like that. <laughs> but it will be a great help in sustaining and maintaining the, your current lifestyle, your, your normal lifestyle, you know? Well, maybe that's a bit far, but it'll help you. It's a stress reliever. You don't have to think about what you're gonna cut back on so much because $500 a month will cover most people's at least one big bill. And if you can cover one big bill per month, mm -hmm. that is, a, a, most people only worry about one big bill per month. And if you can get that covered through a, a, a program like this, 
it is, you know, I mean, the, the benefits are, are tremendous. I would want people to know that it's not necessarily free money, but money that is used um, to help people live a more free life. So whether they use it to, you know, use childcare, start their own business, have a dinner, buy yourself that coffee, you know, pay the big bill. Like how it is used um, is going to have a positive impact on the family's life. And that research has shown that again, most families do use it for like the basic necessities, medical, um, childcare, and that you know like what we put in our people and they, they put back. It allows you to make a plan. It does. You know, yeah. it, you, you, can, you know it's coming in for 24 months. And so you can plan accordingly. Whereas with a lot of other pro programs, if your plan goes through, you're probably gonna lose the benefits of that program and your plan is may, may collapse, so. And kind of like Clarence said, I guess I hadn't thought about it bouncing off it. Like once you meet certain qualifiers for other programs, he said like, mm -hmm. you may not qualify. And for this, I feel like it's propelling you forward. Right. You know, like by not having restrictions on how you choose to spend the money, it's allowing people to get creative and giving them a chance to pursue their dreams and things they might not have been able to do before due to financial barriers. It's life changing. It offers opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be. And it's also an opportunity for our communities to thrive. So I look at it as a win-win situation, both for our government, our economy, and for our citizen, our local resident that is um, struggling, it makes the struggle less. Well, you three aren't done yet. So uh, as, as we wrap up this part of the panel, tell me what your next goals and aspirations are, because you have them, um, you're still leading very full lives. Where is, what is next for you all? To save and purchase my first home. Yes. <laughs> Similarly, um, we would like to purchase a home because right now we live in a townhouse and have more children because right now we only have one. So <laughs> to be there to catch my grandson's first home run. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is there anything I haven't brought up today that you would like to share with the audience before we close? Trust me, the pleasure is all ours <laughs> in listening to your stories and being worthy witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. They were nervous. Can you believe that? No. No born for this, amazing. I'll go one more down. All right. Should I go down? Sure. We've got a lot of chairs. We're gonna so many chairs. Oh, we need chairs too. Should we do this? All right. <coughs> All right, I was, okay, I'm, I still have audio on. This thing fell on the floor earlier, so I didn't know if I ruined it. Um, <laughs> But I just want to say thank you again to our participants. That was incredible. Um, this is really why we're all here doing this work. And if you want to read more about participant experiences, there are these beautiful pamphlets that tell some stories. Um, Bella's included in here. She's on the cover. <laughs> and you can read other participant stories as well. And these are in the back on the table. Um, so we're going to go ahead and transition now into part two. So we've got organizers here from Cook County government as well as the implementation partners. And instead of reading everyone's bios, we're gonna um, just let everyone introduce themselves. So I'll start with you, Shante. Hi, Shante Robinson, Assistant Professor, Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice at the University of Chicago. And I'm also Principal Investigator at Inclusive Economy Lab, working on the Cook County Promise. Uh, I'm Pete Subkoviak, Director of Guaranteed Income and Economic Mobility at Cook County, and I uh, oversee the Promise Pilot. I'm Ben, I am uh, CTO of AidKit, and I write the code sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sarah Moran, I am the US Country Director at Give Directly, so I oversee all of our uh, US-based cash distribution programs. Awesome, all right, well the first question that I have for you all today is, 
I mean, it's really incredible that the Cook County government had the opportunity and like the courage really to say that we're gonna do this and we're gonna try to make it permanent. So, you know, Pete, what can you tell me about what it took to build the political will in Cook County and the confidence to commit to a permanent program? Mm. It's been a, it's been a um, interesting couple of years. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the shorter answer is lots of conversations. Um, we, you know, we started, if you were here for the president's remarks yesterday, we started in 2020 with a one-time um, uh, cash uh, payment in 2020 um, at the depths of the pandemic. And getting to that point, I think that actually the, the, the first six months or so of, of conversations, internal conversations, is probably the hardest part of this. Um, not everybody was bought in. Uh, to this idea, and having the the great data and the research and the evidence um, was was key. And then having very tough conversations where we allowed um, folks to express their concerns and um, meet them head on. Uh, so we let them say, "What are people going to do with this money?" We let them say, "What if they don't want to work?" And then we talked about the reality of the situation, the evidence that we have. So. Um, I would encourage anybody at a government level to uh, have the, da the data and the evidence, which is in support of these programs, um, and then allow those tough conversations uh, to happen and, and be open to the feedback. It ultimately will make your program better. Mm -hmm. And so once we got that buy-in, did the one-time program, it was clear that it was effective. It was clear that it was, uh, there was incredible demand for it. Uh, and the people really needed this program. Um, and so that experience, uh, paired with the fact that President Preckwinkle, you know, she will, she, when she sees that something is effective and is needed, she will do it. She's not going to back down from political wins. Um, so I would say we're, we're lucky to have the leadership we did, but we also did things in a very intentional way um, to make sure that the all leadership in Cook County was uh, ultimately bought in and over time, I would say most became very supportive of the program. The thing I love the most about that is it's taking that same lens of dignity and trust and listening and applying it to everyone, even folks who might have different political ideologies who might be hard to build buy-in. So at the end of the day, we're all people and we have to work together as people to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also that reality of, you know, when you say, when you have a commitment to permanency or making this a long-term program, we also know that there's changes that happen, political administrations change, um, power changes hands. So how do you try to make a program like this unimpeachable? Yeah, so un unimpeachable is our favorite word on the Cook County Promise team. Um, <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that the, the word pilot inherently means something new, and a lot of people hear new, and they hear risky, um, and they hear scary. And so recognizing that doing something that is going to be you know, the largest publicly funded guaranteed income pilot in the country, it's going to mean you're under an intense amount of scrutiny, and you really don't want to screw up, because if you screw up, that does ruin the chance for something like permanence to be something bought in over the long term. So we knew that we wanted to build as Brittany said, a really inclusive program that would enable and ensure people across the county would be able to participate. But we also had to ensure that we were had a, an incredibly um, robust and explainable process to do things like verify people's identity, um, verify, verify people's residency. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll, we'll talk more about the details later, but it was critical up front to recognize that this was uh, a, a program that was going to have a really high bar, and we knew that, and so uh, we had to build, and, and of course, you want to build a you want to build a robust program anyway. But recognizing that you might be under the microscope does um, does mean you have to really think about all of the things that could possibly go wrong and anticipate them in advance. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we are talking about the second largest country in the United States. Um, when applications opened, there were 233,000 people that applied, and that's for 3,250 slots. So um, how do you take a program at that scale and like, how do you make sure that it's both scalable mm -hmm. but also implemented in a way where you can still have that dignified experience at the individual level? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think there are the really three things that you have to do. I think the first thing is you have to sort of 
listen and engage community early and often, um, both to build trust, to make sure people understand that this is for them. Um, you know, this is one of the most broad-based pilots there is. People are up to 250% of the federal poverty line are eligible. Um, the intent was to create a microcosm of Cook County. So you wanted, you needed to ensure representativeness of all of the diversity that exists in the county across the, 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 the pilot. So the first was kind of understand from the community what barriers people would potentially face in getting into the program and accessing the application or the enrollment, building for that upfront. Um, I think the second thing was really, one of the things we tried to do was provide a sliding scale, as Ben and I had said a couple of times, um, from very light touch, self-driven, to very high touch. So we had sort of a progressively high touch process. So if people, um, Bella, for example, wanted to apply online, she could apply online really quickly. Uh, she could then enroll online. I would never have necessarily needed to meet Bella, which is sad for me. Um, uh, but other people, uh, you know, Clarence, I think you mentioned that you applied in person. So we wanted to make sure that people, either because they weren't comfortable using an online application or didn't trust it or just would prefer to come meet someone in person, had an option to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to think about how that scales to the entire size of the county, but I think the point was to demonstrate that it's possible um, and that we could do it efficiently and quickly. Um, and then, so the, if the first thing was listening to the community and the second thing was sort of having this sort of sliding scale of touch, the third thing is then using data to make sure that you're actually getting to the people that you want to get to. And this is where I think the partnership with AidKit was really important. Um, at every single point, every day we were looking at are we actually reaching the people we expect to reach? As applications came in, we had a live dashboard. It was like, okay, what do we expect, you know, uh, Hispanic participation rate to be? What would we expect, um, you know, black, um, you know, black participation to be? And how would that break down over all of these different, you know, geographies within Cook County? And we had that data, so then we could actually direct our outreach teams to go and, uh, you know, mobilize if we felt like certain people were being excluded. And I think, you know, um, uh, Taylor Raquel's story is really important. The last thing I'll say is uh, using data also to advocate for things that need to happen in order to create an enabling environment for the pilot. We had a lot of people apply who were on disability. And without uh, getting the waiver from the SSA that we did, those people would have had a choice to make between keeping their disability or joining the pilot. Um, we were able to use applicant data to show that 7% of applicants had, were on disability, and we could take that number uh, and pass it up the chain so that we were able to then get that protection. Yeah, and I think I would echo a lot of that and add to that. My framing of scale is that you're effectively pushing against two different forces, what I call like the deficiencies of scale and then at really big scale fraud. So in the deficiencies of scale, what I mean by that are all the things that kind of fall off the wagon as you try to add more and more things to that wagon and, and more and more people into the fold. And I think the typical way you do that is you look for how can we kind of reduce complexity, how can we fit people into a box, and what that means is that you end up building something where the people on the other end basically say, basically realize, well, I don't look like everybody else and maybe therefore I'm not worthy for this, which is which is pretty bad. And this is particularly manifested in software where the tyranny of like, well, this is just how it works, is somehow an acceptable excuse, but that should never be an acceptable excuse, right? And we saw this firsthand early on at AidKit. It's a big part of the reason why we exist because we needed software that could adapt to communities. You know, the facts, the fact that we are so diverse and multifaceted is what makes our society great and our software should celebrate that and not oppress it. Mm -hmm. And so that means things like accessibility for people who are, have low vision or people who don't speak English or if they struggle with literacy. Build software and find ways to bring them into the fold and if they're just not comfortable with technology, period, make it easy so that they can walk into a community center near them and, and get into the system on the same playing field as everybody else. And so that is to say that like, you need to think about what are the multiple paths that people can get into the system. And you know, if you're fortunate to have a straightforward way to prove your identity, great, give it to us. But like, you know, if not, here are some other options. You know, if you're unhoused, we shouldn't be asking you for a proof of residence. You don't have it. Like, that's a great way to turn around, turn away a lot of people who need a lot of help. And to then pivot to the second thing, which is fraud, much much less fun thing to talk about, but a very real thing. But I want to start, you know. 
everyone deserves the security that a basic income provides unless you're a bot on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, even before ChatGPT and all that stuff, we saw and stopped uh, fraud in, in many of our programs. And I'm increasingly worried about kind of standing in front of this wave of, with these new tools, the cost to generate uh, plausible fake documentation basically drives to zero, which is gonna be a big thing that we need to think about other defenses for. And so two things that I think about this in context of is we need better systems that can provide access for full program visibility so that you can detect patterns before they become problems and surface them to humans so that they can make judgments rather than arbitrary black boxes that don't align, don't operate in alignment with our values. You know, and that visibility is so key, you cannot slay dragons in the dark. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is we need to evolve how we think about eligibility to lean more on the communities that we serve to build confidence in the participants uh, in our programs. And so on a large scale, what this means, for example, is we work with benefits providers to cross-reference people in the program, so therefore we lower their burden of proof and we increase our confidence that we are hitting the target population that we want to reach. And on a smaller scale, this might mean building systems so that you can collect attestations from community-based organizations on the ground to assert that, yes, this is a real person and they're a real part of my community. And I think to wrap all of that up, I think the, the really important framing when you're thinking about technology and scale is how can we execute the straightforward things with technology so that we can leave the hard stuff to the humans? And I think that's like one of the things that we've done really, really well across this whole program is, is, is just really nailing that balance and, and continuing to work at it because you're never perfect. Awesome, thank you all. Uh, Shantae, I've got a question for you now. Um, what can you tell us about the way that research is designed uh, for this particular program, and what is it that we're hoping to learn? Yes, so at IEL, I've worked with an amazing team, uh, and we've created a multi-method, mixed-method approach. So we have the RCT, which is the Randomized Controlled Trial, that is built in several survey components, uh, including a baseline survey, uh, which people take at the very beginning, which gives you benchmarks for where people are before the money ever even comes out, right? So we have indicators there for health, for mental wellness. We also have indicators for education, for workforce development, just anything you could think of, including uh, criminal justice involvement or uh, connection with the prison industrial complex. Um, and anytime I say criminal justice involvement, I include the prison industrial complex. It's just a theory thing with me. Um, and so we use all those indicators in the surveys at, at baseline, which we continue to do over the course of the entire pilot. We combine that or pair that with the qualitative component. So we've taken baseline interviews of, I forget how many people, but we have several people in the treatment and control team that we're interviewing, in-depth interviews, trying to get a glimpse of what is their life before this money is ever released. Uh, and we're gonna follow those people as, as we can as well over the course of the two years. Uh, combined, we're gonna get a really depth, a really in-depth, nuanced picture of what people in Cook County are dealing with in terms of lived experience and where uh, space is in terms of the different departments in the county uh, that can potentially save money uh, with more guaranteed basic income pilots or with more guaranteed basic income. Uh, and I think Pete can speak more to that, but, but it's very important that we use data to be able to set those benchmarks for the county. Yeah, I think that the data and the research is super critical. Um, I, I think it's um, necessary, but not sufficient to get us where we wanna go. So it's, it's what we, we need. I think in terms of uh, thinking about moving to permanency, the role of our evaluation is, um, you know, we will look at our data and our results to inform what we want to do with a permanent program, should it be targeted to certain subgroups, um, or should it be more broad, or wh whatever. And then the, the second interesting thing uh, about our research that will inform the, the permanent program is that we're um, doing a couple of, uh, we're collecting so much data, but we're doing a couple of deep dives into 
um, three different areas, which is uh, healthcare costs uh, and utilization, um, justice involvement, and uh, housing stability. And that is because those are three uh, cost drivers, uh, main, main cost drivers for Cook County. Mm. We run the health system, mm. we run the county jail. If we, can, if we see evidence, real uh, uh, evidence that, that people are you know, going to the ER less, that people are justice involved less, we can capture those savings and reinvest them in the program. And it'll, it'll increase buy-in within the, le the leadership of Cook County that this is um, a, a valuable thing, not only for the residents that we're helping, but the system and the, the county as a whole. Yes, I love that. And it doesn't just help in Cook County. That's research that can be used and cited across the U.S. and in other places as well to build additional momentum. Yep. Yeah. So we had talked a little bit at the very beginning about making, uh, you know, making Cook County promise unimpeachable. And now we're talking about data. So, you know, what role does the data and the research outcomes and transparency play in kind of building the political will across ideologies? That's to me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know it's you wanted it. I know. I, I, I wanted this question so bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. How do I how do I talk about political ideologies? Rolling up your sleeves. Yeah, yeah, watch out. <laughs> Let me stop. Let me stop. Um, so I'll fir first I'll say there's no amount of data that can be produced in any sort of objective or neutral way that's going to change the minds and political will of certain groups of people. Will never happen. Mm. Mm. And it's because their political ideologies are based in something else and it's not data. Mm. It's based in how they understand people, how they understand culture, how they understand symbols, how they understand uh, their neighbors or who they consider their neighbors. It goes f so much deeper than just the data. So if we want data to move things in, in positive ways, particularly for guaranteed income, it's about reaching those folks where data does matter. And that's for folks who, you know, I think we would consider them moderates or independents, or sometimes those Democrats who are sort of sitting on that fence of, uh, I have to defend this in a very uh, highly contentious area. So how do I convince people that I didn't make this decision based on my own personal beliefs, mm -hmm. and instead it's based on the data? And so that's where we come in, and that's the importance of it. And so you're able to give those folks who are pushable or movable reason to move. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to sort of focus our energy. Those folks who can be moved will look at the data and will use it as evidence to move in a positive direction. To do that, we have to be people that they can trust to do really good data work, right? And that's where Inclusive Economy Lab comes in. We come in to do that really critical work that is both highly skilled in quantitative nature and yet coupled with these amazing narratives and based on people's lives and real lived experiences. Combined, you get this, this vision and this picture of people's lives and how this social policy can play a pivotal role in getting people more to where they need to be, not where we think they need to be, right? Where they need to be to live a fully ac accentuated life. Um, that's the power of data. And so I think if we stay focused on that space of what data can do, and we start doing it really well, we'll see some positive movement in this other area politically. Uh, but political ideologies are funny because we think that, you know, a powerful message and think of No Child Left Behind. That's a really powerful message. Mm -hmm. And even I couldn't get behind it, right? Because I was looking at the data, right? So it's, it's this thing of uh, how do we reach people and how do we move people that are movable um, and use good data to do that. I love that. Is there, yeah, let's give her. Yeah. Yeah. So just to build on that a little bit, um, there's also, I mean, there's something for everyone in the research design from what I understand. So tell me a little bit about some of the outcomes that we're tracking and how those might speak to folks who might not, tradi you, who you might not traditionally expect to be behind guaranteed income programming. Well, as Pete said, indicators in criminal justice involvement, in healthcare, and we're looking at physical health as well as mental well-being. And we know that uh, the pandemic brought on 
it didn't bring, let me, let me say this. The pandemic highlighted areas in our country where we haven't paid a great deal of attention and we haven't given a lot of uh, public sentiment to. Mm -hmm. Issues of mental well-being being one of those spaces. Uh, education, we'll have indicators on education. We'll be able to administratively link this data in some ways. Um, we also have indicators on community involvement. What does your community mean and do and feel and, and all of that. Um, we'll have all of those in the, in the surveys as well as the qualitative component. Awesome. Um, we have a little more time before Q&A, so I want to um, throw a question down to you two at the end, um, Ben uh -huh. and Sarah. So one of the things we talk about a lot is balancing integrity and accessibility. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can, either of you can talk to any of the trade-offs um, in terms of decisions that had to be made during the pilot implementation. You want me to start? I'll start. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think this it was a really difficult thing, and I think also, you know, uh, the fact that it's a publicly funded pilot, um, it shouldn't change the way you think about integrity in a program, but it does influence some of the choices you can make to uh, drive toward integrity. So. Uh, we have a 28-page verification protocol document sitting out there somewhere. I'm looking in the audience to see if my team's out there that's had to sort of abide by it. Um, and I, I mean, I think the, the biggest trade-off was thinking about how do you, the, the metaphor I like to use is like, you don't want to build a wall so high that you're preventing people from getting over it. You want to keep the wall low, but know who the bad actors are who get over it. You know what I'm saying? And so I think the thing that we wanted to push for was there are a lot of uh, verification processes that exist now for, for federal benefits that are actually ineffective at rooting out the bad actors. And instead what they do is they, I mean, I think I heard earlier today when we were in the, the panel um, right after the Bootstraps documentary, this idea that you know there's a lot of circular, cir circular paperwork that's required to prove who you are, to prove where you live. Um, what we wanted to do is we, we basically created a, this is like a little bit technical, but we basically created a, a confidence system in how we evaluated applications for the, for the Cook County Promise Pilot. There were people who could meet a, a high bar. They could, they could cross, they could get over that wall because they have an ID and they either rent or own a home that they get utility bills to. Mm -hmm. Their ID matches those utility bills and that's all they had to provide. Um, there were people who uh, were already enrolled in a qualifying benefits program and all they had to do was prove to us that they were participating in it and that was the only thing we asked for. You know, I think we tried to make it really progressive so that people didn't have to send us 28 pieces of paperwork when they applied. Um, at the same time, I think Ben, you talked about this earlier, we had people, we know we wanted to include people who are not permanent residents of the United States and so if what you had was a consular ID, we were gonna, we were gonna accept that. Um, we then had people who didn't have any form of documentation or any form of residency um, proof, and we had a lot, we had different pathways that they could go down um, to then kind of get into the program, and I think kind of building that all together so that again, the people who could pretty easily uh, kind of self-qualify or, or prove their qualifications, prove their eligibility, could take a very short, easy path. People that were not gonna be able to do that could still take a path that felt dignified that was not actually about us asking them 88 questions to assess their income. Um, and I think we worked really closely with the county to do that, and again, because we're balancing uh, dignity with unimpeachability, the people who should not be in the middle of that choice are the actual participants in the program. Ben, what you got to say? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think, um, you know, the way I think about this, I, I think this is a false, uh, these, these things don't, uh, what am I trying to say? This is not a trade-off. You mm -hmm. can have both. And I think, in fact, um, you know, if, if you start from the principle of we want this money to do it the most good that it can for the most people, then the way to do that is not to go, like, nitpick over, well, you look, you're $1 over the income threshold. The thing to do is to make sure that the people making up a bunch of fake identities who are trying to flood the system don't walk away with all the money. And I think that you know, so often there's, there's this tendency to, to just collect more documents and like, hey, maybe that worked the last 20 years, it's not gonna work for the next 20 years. And I think that you, in order to, to root, this, root this stuff out and make sure the money goes where it should be going, you need to be looking at, you know, 
patterns in, in people doing uh, suspicious things from these suspicious, suspicious actors, and that doesn't cost anything in terms of accessibility. You can build the most accessible application in the world and have good visibility into what's happening across your system to keep the bad actors out at the same time, and they're not in opposition to one another. Yeah, beautiful, good point. Well, we just got the five minute warning, so I would like to invite our participants back up on stage, and we're gonna take a few questions from the audience. Do we right. have a, a mic or something? All right, please raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, sir. Um, the the forty five million dollar uh, figure um, has been has been mentioned, and I'm curious for those of us who are developing programs, what proportion of that is kind of directly going to the clients or the participants, and what is you know different evaluation, monitoring, uh, administrative? Yeah, great question. So just to repeat that really quickly, um, the, it's a $42 million program. How much of that is going directly to participants and how much is put into administration? So Pete, I'll turn that to you. Yeah, so, um, so the vast majority is going directly to the people. Uh, I think it's 39 million. 39. Um, we, are also, we also chose to do, so, so just that your generic cash disbursement program, if you didn't have any evaluation or any outreach like we did, you could have an administrative fee of somewhere between four and five, as low as four and five percent. Most, um, uh, many other government programs, the administrative fee can be 10, 15, maybe even up to 20 percent. So when we talk about good governance and cost savings, that's real. What we chose to do because um, we wanted to uh, have such, uh, we wanted to have great accessibility in terms of um, outreach and in-person application assistance is that we invested uh, significantly there and then of course significantly in our evaluation. So um, it's a $42 million program and um, three million of that is uh, going not going to payments, but going to things like outreach, evaluation, and then we actually have a financial coaching component of this uh, program, which is voluntary, which we just recently ap implemented. So um, we chose to do more than I think, you know, depending on what you're working with and what your goals are, you wouldn't need to do that much, but we, we, we chose to, so. Yeah, great. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Hello, um, I have questions for the participants. Um, so I know that you guys figured out either like online or family or friends told you about the pilot, but in theory, if somebody were to come to your door and canvas you, what are the conversation starters that you guys would be intrigued into so we can start having these conversations? I don't know how likely I would have been possibly to participate from a, someone coming to my door, ringing, that's what you're saying, coming to the doorbell to ring the doorbell. I kind of like the idea of the, because I know flyers are distributed, and for me, seeing it on the news made it feel official and something. Now, if it was following up with me, doing surveys and things like that, I would be open to taking time with the person coming to my door. But otherwise, I, I think to participate and find out about it, I prefer the media of, of um, uh, um, wide notification, because I feel like that's fair too. You, because you may not be so likely to walk up to a door that you might not think that someone lives there. I know I, I um, work with the, um, the Bureau of Economy for um, canvassing the neighborhood to check the yeah. people, the count. And I know some people skipped over houses because if it doesn't look habitable or something like that, you might not, the, the worker themselves might miss a house. So I think it's more fair if it's a public announcement, um, public flyers that are passed out, things like that. I would personally be more 
um, willing to participate in something like that. Great question. If someone did have to knock on my door and say something, I feel like you need like, like a good attention grabber. You know, like, oh, have you ever heard about get the guaranteed basic income program? And if they seem willing, then maybe kind of have like your elevator pitch about it and you know talk about well you know this is how families qualify this is what we do and i think that would have caught my attention i would just say if you're going to do that um you know one of the things that we were really cognizant of was um, our outreach partners that we brought on were all really well established and well known in the communities so you know um, it, it's a different thing if, you know, people and having President Preckwinkle, who people try to say this is a real thing, people are like, okay, what, if she says that, that's a real say, thing. So uh, understanding what organizations or churches or whatever are known and trusted in your community, if you're associated with that, uh, um, those organizations and you're knocking on a door, you're likely to get a much more open response, I would say. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, go ahead. I think it was Clarence who talked about this earlier that one of the things he likes about this program is that once you start doing well for yourself or better, you're not immediately kicked out of the program. You still have the opportunity to keep going on. So I'm wondering if there's any sort of contingency or you know rollout phase if someone's been a part of the Cook County Promise for a few years and you know perhaps they get promotion or they get a better job, they get to a place where they no longer necessarily rely on the Cook County Promise, especially given that it is limited spaces. And so maybe they might be phased out from the program and the opportunity passed on to someone else who needs that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will just say that in terms of what we're thinking about in terms of permanency, we're not thinking about one cohort having guaranteed income in, into perpetuity. We are thinking of a permanent program where maybe there would be a co you know, every two years a new cohort. Uh, and they would have that guarantee uh, for the full two years. So we're not, we're not, this, this won't be uh, a lifetime benefit that people receive. Uh, now what you would do at a, a federal level with a permanent program would probably look different and I can't really speak to that, but that's what we're planning with, with the Promise Pilot. And if, if I can add just one more thing to that, I think Again, this is a, a good example of where values help drive your decisions around programs like this. We made the decision not to recertify or re-verify people throughout the course of the program. Some programs do that, so they, you know, they kind of check in, are you still a resident? Are you still, is your income still what you said it was when you applied? It was, if you're eligible at application, that eligibility is what determines your full participation, which again, to Clarence's point and the point you're making is what allows people to actually plan against that. Um, and the other thing that we decided to do was, um, if, for example, the primary recipient passed away or otherwise was no longer able to receive the payments, we made a plan to ensure that the, that cash could stay at the house in the household. Um, and I think those are also some of the things that we want to, when we do uh, the process evaluation, which I'm so excited about, we want to kind of highlight the things that people, um, yeah, that allowed that money to stay in community and that were very values-driven decisions, you know, when we made them. All right, we're out of time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you to Thank our you panelists. Thank you to our participants. <laughs>